Good evening. I call the Planning Commission regular meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. It is Thursday, October 5th, and we are located in the council chambers at City Hall. Uh, the next item of move business is roll call, so I will start on my right tonight. <coughs> Matthew Petrich. Jane Garrison. Eric Brooks. Shanna Collins. Larry Crandall. Nancy Anderson. Roshino Farrell. Excellent, we are all present this evening, which makes seven of us, and so we do have a quorum. The next item of business is the approval of, of the agenda. And actually, I wanna make a quick note that from now on, I'm going to try using this tool that we learned at training. Um, it's called unanimous consent. So instead of making a motion or calling for a second or a vote for ordinary things like approval of the agenda, approval of minutes, things like that, I will just say, um, I'll say what I want to do, I'll pause. If you guys have any objection, say so. If not, I'll just move forward with it being approved. Do you want us to blurt out our objections or um, raise our hand? To as be loud as you can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> raise your hand and be loud. Um, okay, so for example, it's gonna go like this. I'll try it for approval of the agenda. I will say, is there any objections to approving the agenda tonight? I'll pause. I'll wait for an objection. If I hear none, if there is no objection, the agenda is approved. And then the next item of business is the approval of the minutes. Okay, did I pause long enough? Did you actually do it? Did I? Is that, I mean, is that That's it. Is that it? Oh, okay. That's it. So next item of business is approval of the minutes. We'll do the same thing. Um, is there any objection to approving the minutes from September 21st, 2017? Excellent, if there is no objection, the minutes are approved. So the next item of business is public comment. So this evening, uh, this is the time for non-agenda public comment. There, we allow three minutes per person or five minutes if you are representing an organization. So if there's anyone who'd like to speak on a non-agenda item, please come forward now. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any takers. Well, Kevin's gonna check the list for me. Is there anyone for non-agenda? No, okay. All right, excellent. So the next item of business is old business, which is the stormwater code updates. So what we'll do is have a presentation from staff and then we will have the chance to potentially deliberate on, or then we'll have the public hearing and then we'll potentially deliberate on new motions, I'm hoping. And I think we have Miss Hildy first. Yes. Thank you. Um, so good evening, Kelly Hildy, planning manager with the city of Sammamish. Can you hear me okay? If you know, I'll get closer. Um, before we start our presentation, I'd like to give a brief recap of our September 21st meeting. So we all know where we left off um, and what we hope to accomplish tonight. Um, at the September 21st meeting, the Planning Commission uh, opened and closed the public hearing. A motion was made to approve the proposed amendments to Chapter 1310, 20, 30, 21A, 15, and the Sammamish Addendum to the 2016 King County Surface Water Design Manual. That motion failed. A motion was made to approve changes to SMC 1330, and that passed. And a motion um, was made to continue the public hearing to tonight and to, dis and to further discuss the proposed amendments and uh, take action. So for tonight, our uh, order of events will go as follows. Staff will give a brief presentation, reviewing the information as outlined in your commission packet. The chair will continue and close the public hearing Staff is recommending for the record, um, and this is an administrative action, uh, that a motion be made to rescind the September 21st vote that failed. Um, this will allow the Planning Commission to consider the uh, staff recommended motions as described in your packet. And um, in front of you is uh, a sheet, a document with all of those motions listed. We have eight total, and that is separating each amendment so they can be discussed separately and voted separately. And then of course, we'll, uh, you will deliberate, deliberate and vote. 
So with that, I'm going to actually pass it on to Tani. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Uh, Tani Delzell, Senior Program, Stormwater Program Manager. Um, in your packet, uh, you have Exhibit 1, which is the summary matrix of changes staff had, has proposed since last we met on September 21st. I wanted to highlight two of those changes. Uh, the first would include the changes to the drainage review threshold. So based on what we heard from the last meeting, uh, we have revised that threshold from a threshold of 1,000 square feet of the conversion of pervious surface to impervious surface to now a threshold of 500 square feet of new impervious surface. And what this will allow us to do is to be consistent in our thresholds for critical drainage areas for a drainage review. Uh, and it also allow us to actually do drainage review on uh, projects that um, may propose 999 square feet of, of new impervious. The second change we made was the changes from the tight lines uh, threshold requirement. Previously, there was a, a threshold requirement of 1,000 uh, square feet of conversion of pervious surface to impervious surface. Uh, and what we've done is a tight line is required for any new development that proposes over 500 square feet, so that's drainage threshold for drainage review. So a tight line is required, except if they can do a couple of things. One uh, is uh, have Public Works approve an alternate system based on a geotechnical recommendation, and that recommendation has to consider cumulative impacts on the hazard area. And then second, it has to be, the proposal has to have less than 1,000 square feet of new impervious surface. Uh, so a very small home, as we've been talking about. Uh, what, what I've eliminated based on uh, some of the comments I've received from the Planning Commission this week, and it's different from what is in your packet, is this option B, which is uh, allows public works to determine that a tight line system is not physically feasible. And uh, what this means by physically feasible is um, uh, it can't be engineered. So it's not, it's not economic feasibility. It's not I can't get an easement from my neighbor feasibility. It's I can't engineer it. Uh, and I kind of thought about that and um, came to the conclusion that I don't think that there is any tight line system in Sammamish that is not physically feasible. So I just eliminated that from any uh, option for an exception from the, the tight line system um, to just make it more straightforward. So what I wanna uh, say is that um, staff recognizes that both the public and the Planning Commission are very concerned about the increased risks of landslides uh, in these areas given that we're proposing uh, an increase to the threshold to 1,000 uh, square feet. Um, we've, we've recommended some revised amendments, including the, the geotechnical uh, recommendation for an alternative system that has to account for cumulative impacts and that uh, a very small home of less than 1,000 feet has to be proposed. Um, so we recognize that there is concern, but we also believe that uh, the the incremental increase to the risk of landslide uh, potential in the area is, is small compared to what it is right now. It's a landslide hazard area. Um, but what it does is it allows staff to, or the city actually, to, to fulfill our obligation uh, to adopt code that doesn't constitute a regulatory taking of a legal, um, private property residential lot. So we've worked with the city legal uh, to review the existing code. Uh, they've expressed concern that under the existing code, um, the city may be found liable for damages due to reasonable use of a, a residential zoned lot. Staff has recommended kind of the minimal threshold uh, that 
city legal uh, has expressed less concern about a finding of regulatory taking. And so given that and the, and the belief that this small, there's a small incremental increase in the risk of landslide uh, hazard as compared to what it is today, uh, we do recommend the revised uh, code amendments that we've presented this evening and in your packet. So uh, I just want to move on to next steps. Uh, we will have uh, hopefully the Planning Commission handoff to the City Council on November 6th. Uh, November 21st, we hope to have the first reading of the Stormwater Code revisions and the second reading on December 5th with the City Council. So with that, uh, I would uh, ask that the Planning Commission hold the public hearing unless there's any questions. Okay, I'm ready to open the public hearing. Public hearing is open and I have quite a list of people who'd like to speak tonight. So Debbie Treen is first. And after Debbie will be Kent Treen. And I'm sorry, it's it's seven minutes. Right, Kelly? Um, yeah. Yes, so each correct. person has seven minutes to speak per item tonight. Thank Welcome. you, I don't expect to take seven minutes. Um, and I'll try not to say everything that my husband would have wanted to say. My name's Debbie Treen. I live at 1825 East Lake Sammamish Parkway Southeast. And we've lived there for about seven years. It is within the landslide hazard area. We own about one and three quarter acres. We have a little 1600 square foot cottage on an old lake house that we've been restoring. And we're, we see firsthand what it's like to live in the landslide area. Um, We've worked really hard to preserve our property. We've spent a lot of money on retaining walls, rockeries, to preserve the big cedars and the big dug firs that are on our property. And, and yet, uphill from us, there are, uh, there are property owners who want to build 30 homes on little 5,000 square foot lots. Um, I can't imagine being downstream of that. And it, it literally had me in tears when I heard that. So I very much support uh, the, the drainage work that the Public Works is recommending with the changes, reducing it to 500 square feet. And by the way, I assume that's 500 square feet of impervious surface, which could be a two or three story house. It doesn't mean it's only a 500 square foot house. So I, I, I feel like you're on pretty safe ground with allowing somebody reasonable use of their property. Um, but for me, it's all about protecting that landslide area and even a small incremental increase is pretty scary for those of us who actually live in it and are affected by those above us on the hill. Uh, we were down at Nisqually Delta last week hiking and they have preserved the entire hillside. It is all in the process of being acquired. They're using state conservation money and they are protecting that hillside um, that goes up toward Lacey from Nisqually Delta. And I would strongly urge the city of Sammamish to look at acquiring some of these sensitive properties so that property owners can move on in their lives and we can preserve um, what is so precious to us, both in terms of beauty and, and wildlife, but also just in our own safety and our own homes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker, Kent Treen, and after that it will be Jeffrey Weems. Hi, Kent Treen. 1825 East, Lake, uh, East Lake Sammamish Parkway Southeast. Uh, okay, the Constitution pretty much says that I uh, have a right to the pursuit of happiness. And if I go back in the Enlightenment years, Hobbes, Locke, and those guys were initially said it was property. So with that in mind, the pursuit of my happiness was to purchase property in the city of Sammamish. That brings it to the local level of politics and government. So you as, um, as people who work for a commission that's going to make a recommendation to our elected officials, uh, I would ask that you would do everything in your power to delete, to remove, to get rid of whatever term we need to use here, this pilot program. So that the developments that want to go on in landslide areas or critical areas just won't happen. We need to just stop wrecking 
these sensitive areas, these landslide areas that are so unstable or can be unstable so that we preserve, protect the safety of the community, the people who live either above it or below it. And then the last thing is, and I know this is kind of a little esoteric in, in a sense, is the wildlife corridors need to be protected. I have beautiful animals. I, actually, I have had a doe that's birthed on our property um, two years in a row. And they walk right through the Parker Platt. I followed them. So sorry for being on your property. But the reality is the wildlife, if we're going we're gonna to destroy that too as well, if we don't at least allow some kind of wildlife corridor, and I, you know, it's Parker Platt's part of that. My property is part of it. It's how the animals get down to the lake. And my property isn't going anywhere as far as development goes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Jeffrey Weems. And after Jeffrey, it will be Laureen. Hey. Hi, Jeffrey Weems. Is it on? Tell me if I'm too loud or too quiet. I can never tell. You're Is good. this about right? Yeah. Back here? Okay. Jeffrey Weems, 941-206 Place Northeast, Sammamish, Washington. Um, I just want to get a clarification because I'm, I'm hearing some new stuff tonight. Um, Tawny, is the current proposal for threshold is now back at 500 square feet? Do I understand that correctly? Is, is that the current proposal? Thank you. Can I, yeah, I'll just address it. Okay, I'll, well, I'll yeah. address it to the, just, is council clear? Is the, so the proposal that we were talking about last. Yes, last it has changed. Was 1,000, so it's been changed to 500 square feet. Yes. Okay. Um, I thought that it might be useful to just take a quick look back and talk about uh, the process. How did we get here? Um, Inglewood and, and Tamarack par parcel owners came to the city council and to the planning commission. You guys, many of you will uh, remember that various people came and spoke, property owners came and spoke before you. Um, and that started back in about April of 2016 and we're now in October of 2017. So that's about 1.75 1, 1 years of property owners from these, uh, these areas that are ca now called drainage hazard areas coming and speaking before the council and before you folks to express their concerns about their property development rights. Um, we also, from the Inglewood side, we scheduled a couple of question and answer meetings with city staff to try to understand what the emergency ordinance uh, that was passed three years ago really meant. Um, and so we, we did some, some work uh, in terms of trying to provide input from the property owner standpoint. Um, because of the speaking before the city council and speaking before the planning commission, the council directed that the city staff would look at appropriate updates to the stormwater management code to address, to hopefully find the right balance of public safety, environment, and property rights for the, uh, that the owners were expressing concern about. Um, so there were some more meetings between some of the property owners and the city staff, the stormwater meeting staff. That was about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and the staff uh, did a nice job of scheduling a public hearing, or not a public hearing, a public meeting about uh, the Inglewood ordinance. And they very appropriately mailed out a, a letter through the post office to all of the property owners in Inglewood so that they had a decent chance of knowing about it. Um, so I, I compliment them on taking that step because I think that's an important thing for the city to do rather than rely on a notice in the Seattle Times, which is what happened before. Um, the public meeting, the majority of the people that came were property owners that were, I would say, in general, probably three quarters of the comments were from property owners who were concerned about their property development rights and looking for amendments to the Inglewood ordinance and the Tamarack ordinance, I guess, indirectly now, um, that, that would more fairly, they believe, address their property development rights. Those comments were provided to the Planning Commission members in a packet. I don't know whether they're in the current one, but they were in the packet last week. So then the next step was staff was just said, okay, we'll go off and we will look at this. And so the really we have to d defer to the experts on the stormwater management staff and the development staff. They are experts in this area. They've studied it. They have degrees and training and that we will never have. They went off and tried to determine what is what could be done or what might, might make sense that would balance public safety, 
the environment. We're hearing people talk about public safety. Obviously, it's a concern. The environment is also a concern, and property rights. And while it's, it's possible that people that live down on the lake would like to see zero development ever happen anywhere else above them, uh, you know, I don't know that that, for the 500 or 600 odd property owners above them, I don't know whether that's, that's actually uh, a, you know, a reasonable balancing of the public safety environment and, and property rights. So staff created a, a, a set of proposals and, you know, I think their proposals were actually still rather restrictive on property rights, but they created a set of proposals and they presented those in a couple of meetings to you folks. And you folks very quickly identified, wait a minute, we don't really like these proposals because they, they are not perfect. They make a number of trade-offs that we're not quite sure really feel correctly. And, and anything like the proposals that they're making be, are going to involve some trade-offs. And I think the, the questions that were asked were reasonable, but I'll get, get, get going here and get to the point. So also property owners that have been impacted came and spoke before the Planning Commission at these two meetings that we've had to discuss this. So we get to where we are now. So what should happen now? We think, I think that the amendments that are proposed by the expert staff, it, that where they try to make that balancing act between the different priorities, are still very restrictive to parcels in the drainage hazard areas. You require drainage hazard review, uh, you require drainage review for a single family home of typical size, you know, it's one thing to talk about, to show some pictures of little cabins with no driveways and no garages, but that's not the type of homes that are typically built, that are already built and that would typically want to be built in these areas. So I, I'm not sure I, that, that I agree that reasonable use is even satisfied by 1,000 square foot impervious, but that's fine. So if, they, if for safety and environment we need to have tight lines, then let's get, let's recognize that what staff has proposed still requires a tight line to below the drainage hazard area if you're going to do a, re a normal size house that would be typical for that neighborhood, still requires a tight line. So it's not like, like they just said, okay, do whatever you want. It's still, it's still very restrictive. I think the 500 square foot concession to, to I don't know why she made that change. I, I think it was, it was a reasonable step in the right direction to make it 1,000 square feet instead of 500. I'm just going to make one clarification. It's 500 for the drainage review and 1,000 square feet for the tight line. That's, that's the new, that's the new uh, recommendation well, from okay, staff. So what it was before, though, was we were going to allow people to do 1,000 square feet of deck. I disagree with the, with the general contention that a house can be built with the 1,000 square feet of impervious. It's not, not, not realistic. But leaving that aside, you know, it seems like we just went from 1,000 to 500. And so interestingly... Um, we're back to exactly the same thing as the emergency ordinance. That originally, the emergency ordinance that three years ago was passed with no public input, with the 500 square feet restrict, uh, threshold for drainage review and tight line required to below the drainage hazard area for any development, not allowing infiltration, not allowing anything else. Maybe I'm confused, but I think we're back to basically the same, the same thing that prompted this whole thing. Um, I do, I do want to say one other thing about this. This is Wrap it up because we do have other speakers tonight. This is Form 17. Property owners are required to disclose any unusual restrictions on the property that would affect future construction or remodeling. These, 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 these codes do create special restrictions for homes in these areas, and we're going to ask that the city acknowledge that so that we're able to go to King County and get a reduction in the taxable value of these properties because they are restricted in a significant way. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next is Lorene, and I'm sorry, I just can't read the last name. I think it's Cap Capella. That's La Pena. La Pella. Thank you, Lorene Welcome. La Pena. I live at 905, 206 Place Northeast. I, uh, Jeff is, is one of my neighbors. Uh, and I just wanna say, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit confused by the changes that, that we're seeing now. Um, I I do want to say that 500 square feet is not reasonable. Uh, a thousand square feet I felt like was in a, a step in the right direction, and I would have to understand more uh, what we mean by the thousand square feet tight line 
I, I don't quite understand that. But my main point is I'm also for the environment, and all of the development has been disturbing to me also. Um, but as Jeff mentioned, there has to be a balance between individual property owners' rights uh, and big development. I'm, wildlife and the environment is, is very important to me. So I don't want to see big developments uh, that, that in, in, endanger uh, our critical areas either. Um, but the situation I'm in is I've already had these giant monster houses built above me uh, and below me. And I'm just an individual property owner with one little parcel uh, that that I just want to make sure it's worth something because I suck a lot of money into it and I pay a lot of taxes for it. And uh, I just want to be able to sell it at a reasonable, uh, a reasonable value, which means you have to be able to build a reasonably sized home on it um, without the enormous expense of, of having to tight line uh, down to the parkway. So it's like we either need the infrastructure to be able to do that at a reasonable expense, um, or we need to be able to build uh, with some alternative uh, means. And from my point of view, a thousand square feet of, of, of impervious surface is, is okay. Um, but 500 square feet is, is just not reasonable, especially, I mean, that's a tiny house <laughs> and, and you don't even have a driveway. Even if you did three levels, you know, you, you have to think about a driveway or, or a deck or, or something like that. So I just want to make sure that we're, we're taking into consideration both the environment and the, the individual property owner rights. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Peter Kelly, and after that will be Sheila Kelly. My name is Peter Kelly, uh, 19418 Southeast 21st Street. Uh, more here to talk about the second agenda item, but uh, this is seems to be tied into it. Uh, and what really sparks my interest is that the definitions. If it's a drainage hazardous or a landslide area, I would recommend moving it to less than 500 square feet. I understand property rights, I understand restrictions. I also understand that we all have the freedom to choose where we live and where we purchase and how we do it. And if you don't like the rules, then we move on to someplace else. Um, hazardous, landslide, these are big words that <laughs> really mean a lot to me. And I think we can develop, we can develop smart. However, it's going to take strong, actionable codes to enforce the safety and the, the preserve the land around us. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker would be Sheila Kelly. Good evening, I'm Sheila Kelly. I live at 19418 Southeast 21st Street. Um, I want to reiterate what my husband said. Uh, I feel strongly about um, the erosion uh, areas, the hazard areas, because um, it seems to me that it's getting worse rather than better. And I think, although there is an opportunity, obviously, to revisit this in the future, which is understandable, um, one of the things we need to realize, too, and perhaps you, you already do, um, is that it's, it's never gonna get any better than it already is. So in addition to um, paying attention to restricting certain kinds of land uses, especially um, putting in a lot of impervious areas, um, I think it's important to realize that the further we move down this road, um, it's always gonna be worse. It's the best it's gonna be right now. And I can go in my backyard and I can, I can show you pictures of the very bottom of our septic system, which is right, you know, my, my backyard aligns um, up to the Parker Platte. And I can show you pictures of the very bottom of my septic system that is now exposed. Now, there hasn't been any septic down there ever, I don't think, because it's, you know, four times as big or eight times as big as it needs to be. But the hill that it's on is just, going right down, the, right down the hill. So 
it's, it's a problem and it's never gonna get better. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is Jay Rockney. My name is Jay Rockney, 121826 Place, Northeast, Sammamish. Uh, my situation is very unique, in the, I think it's unique, <laughs> in the fact that uh, I believe when the coding, the new coding, uh, the city adopted in 2016, which uh, for my case, I have more than half an acre of land, two tax parcel, have a little house of about 1,500 square feet, two bedroom, and then I became a father, believe it or not. <laughs> And I wanted to add one room for my daughter. So came to the city, going back and forth, uh, being a working person. And I was told, yes, less than 500 on in previous my concrete driveway, it's all good. And then the city adopted this code of the fact that less than 500. Uh, and I came back and forth again, I'm a working person. I just wanted to add one little bedroom for my daughter because it's even though it's a uh, two bedroom, but it's on three story. And so I believe because of all the situation, everybody's speaking of the hazard and all of that, the city adopted this, uh, you know, nobody thought King County's regulation and Sammamish codes were really easy to work with and or, uh, uh, you know, less than 500 has been in effect for all those years. And so then all of a sudden I was told no. So this proposal by this thousand, which would have been really, really uh, more reasonable, uh, as every, you know, a lot of, uh, owners, and again, I'm not talking about my second parcel that we pay in tax. King County taxes us from as like has a value of last four years. My house is four years. Okay, put that aside. But the fact that I think it's very, very reasonable. And I've talked. I'm in medical field. I don't know nothing about. Uh, you know, I do realize that uh, it's very important. I don't want my house or any of my neighbors or anybody get washed away. But uh, when I talk to experts, the engineers, the professionals. And to be honest, they laugh and they sympathize and they want to make money to go ahead and say, well, yes, and yeah, I could do this review and or get a pipe to Inglewood, which costs $100,000. But again, see, my la the room that I want to build is impervious on my driveway. So they said the net effect of the, the rain or drainage is going to be zero. It is already zero, right? In previous, it's not, you know, it's on the concrete. So this code that was adopted in 2016 that a review has to be done, uh, it sh there should have been an exemption, I'm, and I hope you consider that. I don't know if I'm making sense or not because I'm you know, a bit emotional, but, and, and so uh, again, I've gone to three Sukkot Redmond engineers that have worked with cities of Amish for like 30, 25 years, and they know this business, and they smile. They say, you know, this code doesn't make sense, especially for your case, because now, you're building this room on, under this concrete in previous, and then they're saying, the city is saying, folks, you have to do review, and this is very costly, and then put a pipe into Englewood. And let me say one other thing about the fact that, see, uh, what is happening, and like everybody's saying here, I have a half an acre, 1,500 square feet. If I'm forced, like a gentleman said, right, I chose to live here. If I'm forced to go back to Texas, where I came from 10 years ago, which I really am considering, I, I don't have a choice. Then what happens, somebody's gonna buy my land eventually, half an acre, and it's gonna put eight houses on it. They're, they're doing it on 3,000 square feet. And is that, okay, yeah, right. They, you know, put a pipe and whatever. I'm not an engineer, but having an eight house and one more little house, I mean, is that what we want? And you know, uh, would that help? And eventually when people like me, working people are forced because it is hard, hard, uh, rules and that experts are laughing and saying this doesn't make sense, then eight houses are going to go up in property, my little bitty houses of, of uh, you know, 1,500 square foot. And eventually, in time, all this land where we've seen it, you know, and, I mean, it's ridiculous that a house is going on the 3,000 square feet and it's going to happen. So I think uh, being reasonable, if we working people could have a 17, 1,500 square feet on a half an acre, on an acre, would be better than having 12 houses. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the next speaker is Mary Wichter.
And the, the speaker after that is Cindy Taylor, and that will be the last speaker. And if you're missing your packet. Um, my name's Mary Wichter. I live at 408 200 8th Avenue, Northeast in Sammamish. I live in Tamarack. <coughs> um, so between the last meeting, I sent you guys some stuff on maps, vacant lands, soils and sub-basins, and this morning something on mini sub-basin based on Commissioner Petrich's comment. Um, Tamarack is shown here in blue. You can outline it on King County IMAP. And here's the environmentally critical areas of landslide hazard, erosion, seismic, wetlands, and streams as a vicinity map kind of overall. Oops, sorry. Um, so here I zoomed in on Tamarack. Tamarack's that blue ghostly area. And you'll see that thing running through it. That's the landslide hazard area. And then those little red squares, those are sensitive area notices that were recorded on the title by King County. They only did it for about the first half of the 1990s, so it's not all of them, but it kind of gives you an idea of where critical areas are. And then if we look at Inglewood, which is just to the north of us, you'll see that Inglewood also has that landslide hazard strap. Um, they don't have the landslide hazard drainage areas on here because it's King County, um, but I wanted to show you that because we're kind of like butterflies. We're connected together in the areas and geology and slopes. I also had sent you information on vacant lots that I got from the growth management, uh, or excuse me, the growth round table last fall. I've heard that Inglewood is 90% developed. If it's got over 500 lots, that leaves 50 lots that are still leaving to be developed. And you can see the distribution of those lots in the top rectangle there. Tamarack is 80% developed at this point, and there are 40 vacant lots remaining. So you can see in those boxes, 50 plus 40 is 90 lots, 1,000 square feet. That's 90,000 square feet. That's over two acres of impervious surface, what you're talking about. I also want to point out here, we're back to a little zoom out again with Tamarack. Um, the erosion area by King County is a kind of a light greenish gray thing. So you can see the erosion hazard areas there. Those do not occur in Tamarack, only by the George Davis Creek in the west and south basins. There are no erosion, no protection for that in Tamarack in the west flowing or south flowing areas. You also learned last week, or on the last meeting, that critical drainage areas, um, they were shown in the yellow hashed area, and we did learn that the yellow hash area underlies the orange landslide hazard area. So this is the map for that Tawny had done as exhibit sit for the last meeting. And I also told, informed you about the new Sammamish property tool, which was put up in August. It's pretty good to use. It's just like King County IMAP. So here, I've zoomed in, so the Inglewood area is kind of on the top, and then Tamarack on the bottom, and then we're gonna turn on look different environmental critical areas. Are you ready? There's what the seismic hazard looks like. And Mark Cross tells me that's maybe from sloshing that'll happen from the lake in a seismic hazard. And then there's the shoreline designation. And as you know, we have the shoreline management program for that area. And then if we turn on the erosion hazards near sensitive water bodies, that's a purple hash area, which has very strict things on it. And then the city also started mapping very recently the no disturbance area. No disturbance area is shown in pink. You'll notice none of these things have turned on in Tamarack yet. So then the erosion area, which is kind of a light tan, whitish beige, that's kind of an old overlay on top of everything. That again does not occur in Tamarack at all. The first time you see anything occur in the Tamarack area is the landslide hazard area. And you'll see I call it the belly band or the isthmus that runs through Tamarack. And then if we turn on the landslide hazards drainage area, that's the drains too. So those are the areas where you don't want water going in. And you'll notice that Tamarack's actually missing a piece. So it used to look like this, and now it looks like this because that piece drained too and we weren't getting enough protection there. So that was changed in the maps that is effective as of January 1st of this year. So if I remove, so right now I'm removing the, ero uh, the uh, erosion hazard areas, no sorry, I'm removing, it really displays wrong here. I'm removing the landslide hazard area. You can kind of see the shading go away. So you'll see the landslide hazard drainage area shows under that. So it does underlie everything. And then if I remove the erosion hazard area, that's kind of hard to see. Do you see how the beige is going off? You'll see that the Inglewood area has erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies, landslide hazards, drainage areas, no disturbance areas, shoreline, all the way down. It's a very complicated area where Tamarack only has the landslide hazard drainage area, which is why I'm really worried about you changing the code there. So for Tamarack, we only have those protections. And then the other circle there is also where Ebright Creek is. Those are the only two places in the city other than maybe Sahali way up there by the Gray Barn um, that have landslide hazard area and no other code protection. So I think you need to be very careful about any changes that you make. 
So if you take the landslide hazard protections away or the areas away, you will see that the landslide hazard area is left, which is the bottom portion of the drains too. So then if we just look at the Inglewood neighborhood, this is from the ordinance map. And if we go to the south portion, the capital improvement project was done to help the top of the north area there. But if we zoom into the southwest corner, you will see what it looks like. And you can see the yellow there is steep slopes and the blue is the landslide hazard area and the red is the outline of the Inglewood area. And you can see the different sized parcels that are there. Some are smaller, some are wider, and they vary a bit in size depending on how it came historically. In Inglewood, you'll see here that they have the landslide hazard area in orange. They've got the erosion, which covers pretty much most of that map. And then the purple is the erosion hazards near sensitive water bodies. So they have a lot of protection and the people say they aren't having problems here, I believe due to the fact that they have had code protection. And then if you pull off the erosion hazard area, you'll see the no disturbance area. So if you are west of 207th Street, which is the last street in that little notch there, if you're west, you're actually in a no disturbance area for development. And I don't think you could see these on maps before because the city never mapped until just a couple months ago. So Tamarack was platted in 1964. We have landslide hazard areas and under that line, landslide hazard drain two areas with the map fix. We do not get any code protection from erosions. And with drainage issues that we've had, we do, we've had landslides, we have water runoff, it's flooding all the way down to the parkway and flooding streams and lakes. Um, we've had 20 new homes put in the west area, 40 new homes have been built overall, and we still have 40 locks. So please, don't make the code weaker. We actually need a moratorium in Tamarack until the CIP can be implemented to deal with drainage issues. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, the final speaker on the list is Cindy Taylor. I'm Cindy Taylor, and I live at 250 208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish in the Tamarack area. What historic plats don't get is the code protection that is so essential. The Tamarack plat was established in 1964. 210 lots were recorded by King County assessors, and there were no phases. Tamarack is zoned R4, and each lot is about 11,000 square feet. We are approximately 80% developed, and 40 lots remain that can be developed. I understand that Inglewood was established in 1889 as a paper plat with more than 500 lots. Inglewood is also zoned R4, but its lots are smaller. Inglewood is about 90% developed, and there are over 50 lots remaining that can be developed. Tamarack and Inglewood don't need short plats. The subdivisions already exist. A short plat is used to create two to nine lots in an urban growth area. State, county, and city laws require that builders of short plats do these things. Ensure that new lots meet the minimum zoning requirements, protect the interests of the seller, buyers, builders, and neighbors, and plan wisely for community growth and neighborhoods and also prevent or mitigate drainage problems, traffic and safety problems, and public health hazards. This is an example of a subdivision review for Morningside. Morningside is a development being built above Tamarack just over the ridge. It has 20 new single family residents and five acres were cleared for the development. Morningside gets a landscaping plan, lighting, and parks. The net density applies if there are environmentally critical areas. Neighbors gave concerns for stormwater discharge to their downslope properties and for steep slopes, and they were heard. Morningside and the neighbors get street improvements, traffic studies, and road improvements, and they get bonding for um, security performance and landscaping. From the Sammamish Municipal Code, erosion hazard areas get these things. Land can only be cleared, graded, and filled during the dry season. There are water quality standards and also monitoring of water quality. Temporary erosion and sediment control has contingencies and seasonal suspensions. Owners must provide financial guarantees, monitor off-site discharges, <clears throat> permanently stabilize the site, and restore any off-site impacts. 
plus the city is responsible for materials, labor, and costs should the project be stalled or not completed. A geotech is needed to grade, stabilize, restore, and analyze susceptible soils. All vegetation management must be done by a certified professional. In my experience in Tamarack, this is what we get. No clearing limits or large-scale landscaping review. No parks, no help from net density because only one help, one home is built per lot. There is no notice given to neighbors when a lot is going to be built on and thus no neighbor inputs or concerns are considered. This is especially concerning for downhill properties. There are no traffic studies done nor any street improvements made. No bonding is required. No recorded notices are put on titles when the house is built, such as um, the home is in a sensitive or a landslide area. Tamarack has steep slopes greater than 15% and even greater than 40%. We have landslide hazards, yet no tight line exists for drainage serving the steepest areas that are getting the most development. In 2016, there were a lot of stormwater adoptions that became effective on January 1st of this year in Sammamish. The city moved from the 1998 and 2009 King County Stormwater Manual to the 2016 King County Stormwater Manual. And the Landslide Hazard Drainage Areas Drains to map was also modified. It is important to note here that the city's MT, MPDES permit requires that all lots, not just those greater than one acre, have regulations for stormwater. A builder for one home cannot be allowed to not meet the requirements just because of the expense. Tamarack has critical drainage areas that include landslide drainage hazard areas and the city should keep the five emergency surface water management ordinances restricting building to 500 square feet of impervious surfaces and no exceptions or exemptions should be made for drain it to the drainage core or special requirements one through nine. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak during the public hearing this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And what we need to do now is have a motion to rescind the the failed motion from last meeting. So, oh, thanks, Kevin. Um, I do need to recuse myself from this vote because um, my house is actually located in a landslide hazard area and I recuse myself from the vote on the 21st. Um, but after consulting with staff, I don't actually need to leave the room. So I'm going to stay here and conduct my chair duties and let you all deliberate and vote and make motions. I'll just kind of stay here and make sure everything stays on track. I'll go ahead and make the motion. I move that the Planning Commission rescind the motion that did not pass at the second vote. Sorry about that. There. As vice chair, I will make the motion. I move that the planning commission rescind the motion that did not pass at the September 21st, 2017 meeting relating to the proposed amendment to chapters 13.10, 13.20, 13.30, 21A.15, uh, Sammamish Municipal Code, and the Sammamish Addendum to the 2016 King County Surface Water Design Manual. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, so are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Those in favor Please signify by aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, the same sign. Uh, hearing no opposition, the motion is passed as stated. Okay, so with that, now that the motion had, or now that that motion has been rescinded, we can move on to the motions that have been provided to us by Tani in the presentation. So I'd like all the planning commissioners to turn to that part in the packet 
where they list uh, motions one through eight because I want to trade off each of us. Um, yeah, you can use that. that this, the one you have on your, on your, at the dais is also appropriate. Um, so maybe we can trade off. I will be able to participate in motions one through six. I will recuse myself from seven and eight. So um, if anyone would like to start with the first motion. Uh, since I finally have the mic working here, uh, I move to recommend to the city council staff proposed amendment to Sammamish City Code, Municipal Code 13.10, which includes adding a new definition for, for municipals separate storm sewer systems, MS4. Se second. There's, you're still still, so. Okay. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second to recommend that City Council and staff, uh, staff propose amendments to 1310, which includes adding a new definition for municipal separate stormwater s or storm sewer systems. All those in favor? Or I'm sorry, we didn't deliberate. Is there anybody who wants to say anything? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say no. And that passes unanimously. Okay, uh, well then I will uh, um, move to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to Sammamish uh, Municipal Code 21A.15, which revises the definition of critical drainage area uh, to reference citywide standards. I second that motion. There's been a motion and a second to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 21A.15, which revises the definition of the critical drainage area to reference citywide standards. Um, is there any debate on this? Okay. All those in favor of recommending to City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 21A.15, which revises the definition of critical drainage area to reference citywide standards, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. And that passes unanimously. Does anyone else want to try number three? I'll go. Um, move to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 13.20, which removes duplicate language for core requirements, special requirements, and drainage adjustments already found in the adopted surface water design manual. I second that motion. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any deliberation? Nope. Okay. All those in favor of, a, of a recommending to City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 13.20, which removes duplicate language for core requirements, special requirements, and drainage adjustments already found in the adopted surface water design manual, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say no. That also passes unanimously. I move to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 1320, which requires development subdivisions to provide low impact development education and outreach to new single family residential homeowners. I second that motion. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any debate? Seeing none, all those in favor of recommending to City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 13.20, which requires development subdivisions to provide low impact development education and outreach to new single family residential homeowners, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say no. And that passes unanimously. Anyone want to take number five? Uh, I move to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 13.20.040, which allows exemptions in critical drainage areas from core requirements three through eight. Uh, second. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any debate? 
All those in favor of recommending to the City Council staff proposed amendments to SMC 13.20.040, which allows exemptions in the critical drainage areas from core requirements three through eight, say aye. 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 Anyone say no? Or anyone opposed say no? That passes unanimously. And number six. Uh, back to me. I move to recommend to the City Council that Inglewood Historical Plat Ordinance 2015-389 uh, be repealed to allow consistent requirements in all landslide hazard drainage areas. Seconded. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any debate? Seeing none, all those in favor of recommending to the City Council that Inglewood Historic Plat Ordinance 2015-389 be repealed to allow consistent requirements in all landslide hazard drainage areas, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. That passes unanimously. And I'll turn it over to Larry for the last two. Um, I'll go ahead and move on number seven. Move to recommend to the City Council staff proposed amendments to drainage review under Sammamish Municipal Code 13.20.020, which includes a revision of the threshold for drainage review in critical drainage areas to 500 square feet of new impervious surface. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the recommended motion number seven, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion is unanimously uh, passed. Nancy, do you want to read eight for me? I move to, it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> I move to recommend to the city council staff uh, proposed amendments to SMC 1320.040 and the Sammamish Addendum to the 2016 King County Surface Water Design Manual, which would require a tight line system in areas located in a landslide hazard drainage area unless exemptions can be met in accordance to core requirements number one in the 2016 King County Surface Water Design Manual including an approved alternate drainage system that considers cumulative impacts and less than 1,000 feet of new impervious surface is proposed. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, recommended motion number eight. Is there any uh, discussion at this time? Hearing none, call for the vote on the recommended motion number eight. Those in favor, signify by stating aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion is unanimously, unanimously uh, passed. Nice work. Okay, in that case, we are finished with this item of business. Just let me collect. Uh, do we actually need to close anything? Do we need to make a vote to close the public hearing? Um, you already did. We already close did. Okay. Public hearing, yes. Oh, sorry, Jane. Is it possible just to, I, I didn't sit th all the way through Robert's Rules of Order, so I don't know if I'm out of order. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments because there were so many people here tonight, and I feel mm -hmm. like some of them may not understand or it may not be they might not be addressed please go ahead I w first of all I would really like to thank Mary Wichter for all those maps and reports I I can't believe how much work she did and I I did go through as much as I could uh, I I read parts <laughs> of the Ingle Nook and Tamarack uh, to see what the underlying soils were and I so I felt comfortable with some of the decisions that have been made uh, from Tawny and Kelly, uh, and I'm sorry for using your first names, but they really uh, 
did a lot to go back to this 500 square feet with uh, conditions. They had to put conditions on it to make everything work, and I thought they worked it out very well, and I really uh, do appreciate that. Um, I probably should have said that I think that uh, we need a definition for critical drainage area in this, in this part of the code. We don't have it. it. We have to go to another part of the code to get it. And it's very important. It's crucial to understanding uh, 1310 and 1320. And then my other comment is um, if reasonable use is a concern, it to me it doesn't belong in the hazardous section of the code. It belongs... There is, uh, 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 in, in 21A60702, they can apply for a, an uh, exception through that. That should not be uh, a consideration in the hazardous critical areas section of the code. And I just wanted to say that to address some of the concerns that were brought up. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jane. Okay, with that, the next item of business is, hang on one second, I'm sorry. The next item of business is the erosion hazards near sensitive water bodies overlay no disturbance area code. So um, after a presentation by staff, each commissioner will have a chance to ask questions tonight. And I believe Mr. Pyle will be making the staff presentation. Good evening, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, David Pyle, Community Development Department. Um, as uh, Chair Collins uh, had identified, uh, we are here tonight to talk about the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies, no disturbance area pilot program. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to uh, review the content of the uh, previously incorporated erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies pilot program um, and the proposed elimination of the program in anticipation of the uh, October 2017 public hearing, which is, is your next meeting. Actually, no, it's two meetings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the Planning Commission's role tonight is uh, in, in a role of policy input and providing input uh, and feedback to staff. Uh, our hope tonight here is that you'll be able to walk through uh, the content of the program, uh, our analysis, and make a recommendation to staff um, to come back with a um, certain direction for public hearing at the October 16th meeting. As you can see here, um, this is a three-part process. On September 21st, if you recall, we had an overview of the city's environmentally critical areas regulations and how they all fit together, where they come from, what we do with them, et cetera. And tonight's meeting um, is the uh, work session, and then on October 21st, we'll be coming back with a public hearing. A little bit of background, um, as was included in tonight's um, agenda memo, uh, the pilot program uh, was originally incorporated into the city's environmentally critical areas through uh, a lengthy process by which the, uh, the environmentally critical areas rules were updated and ultimately adopted in 2013. However, there was a stipulation in those rules that said that the pilot program would not become effective until the city's shoreline master program was updated, which took a few years. The Department of Ecology was involved. There were several other elements that were holding it up, so it took a little while for it to actually become uh, effective. It was made effective on uh, March 1st of 2017. Um, following that, um, in uh, May of 2017, uh, there was a discussion by the City Council regarding the adequacy of the program, um, given the, uh, the intent or purpose of those, of the, erosion hazard or sensitive water bodies regulations. 
the council declared an emergency, passed uh, an interim regulation that uh, struck the pilot program from the erosion hazard or sensitive water bodies regulations um, and directed that uh, staff evaluate the components of the pilot program, engage the planning commission and come back to them with a recommendation on what to do with the, the, the uh, pilot program. Um, there's a lot of acronyms that are gonna be thrown around here. Um, there are three primary acronyms that I wanna make sure you're aware of. The erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies, um, the no disturbance area, and the properties draining to the no disturbance area. If you recall from the agenda memo, they're, they're laid out in there as well. As was discussed uh, at your last meeting on this topic, um, Geoscience areas are uh, considered to be critical areas. Uh, we have several of these in our code. One of those areas is uh, the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay. The erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay, or excuse me, the erosion hazard areas um, are areas that are typically susceptible to a higher rate of erosivity uh, when disturbed and they're those soils that are typically found on somewhat of a slope and have a certain composition or um, basically the, the soil pad, if I, if I can channel some of the, the um, geologists that have come through our offices, is, is from a certain generation of, of glacial movement that the sediment that's there is, is susceptible to erosion, meaning that if it were to rain on it or there was water to pass over it, that it would erode and unravel very quickly. The erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay um, is a specific erosion hazard area that um, if it were to be disturbed and it were to erode would, would directly impact um, lakes or streams or water bodies of high resource value. So we have um, further more restrictive regulations that apply to erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies than to just the erosion hazard areas. This is uh, an area of, of heightened sensitivity um, and we wanna make sure that any actions we're taking in this area is, is um, not going to cause for uh, somewhat of an illicit discharge into one of our water bodies and a degradation of water quality. Uh, the erosion hazard near sensitive water body overlay is divided into two areas, the no disturbance area, which we'll get to here in a second, and also the properties draining to the no disturbance area. So the no disturbance area would be the slope and then the property draining to it would be that above it. And we'll see those in the definitions and in the maps. Um, the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay, um, as I said prior, is, is that that's established on that slope portion. Um, so if you think about the, the, the plateau and the landmass that is the plateau, you have a flattened area and then it sharply drops off down towards Lake Sammamish. So those areas where there are certain types of soils and where it drops off down towards Lake Sammamish is typically known as the no disturbance area. Um, there's also the properties that drain to those that are immediately up, up slope of those, um, right on the sort of the, the fringe of the, of the drop off. The purpose of the erosion hazard in your sensitive water bodies overlay, and this is important, um, is to provide a means to designate sloped areas posing erosion hazards that drain directly to lakes or streams of high resource value that are particularly sensitive to impacts of increased erosion and the resulting sediment loads from development. So what we're saying here is that we wanna protect these specific areas in the city uh, from advanced erosion and the sediment that can be, sediment loads that can be deposited into our lakes and streams as a result of that. Uh, the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay also includes a limitation on development in the no disturbance area as was outlined in the memo. Um, there are some things that can occur in the no disturbance area, such as single family residences, utility corridors, um, streets, public parks. Um, there, be, because development is, is generally prohibited in the no disturbance area, subdivisions are not allowed. Um, the pilot program um, was implemented uh, to allow for limited subdivision, um, including clearing and development, 
um, within this area. So um, you'll see here that that the erosion hazard in your sensitive water bodies overlay um, allows for some limited subdivision activity, um, but it's also not authorized within specific uh, basins. These basins were found to be inappropriate to allow the limited subdivision activity, so it, it really is a very narrow area where subdivisions were allowed through the pilot program. The purpose of the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies um, pilot program, as I said prior, was to allow for limited instances of subdivision. Um, there are only four subdivision projects authorized by this pilot program. If you recall from the memo, um, oops, there are there are two uh, tight line projects and two projects that are required to implement uh, low impact development techniques both of which are fairly restrictive, um, and we'll get to that here in a minute. So where are the erosion hazard areas um, and where are the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies? Uh, the white areas are the erosion hazard areas and the orange areas are the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies. Um, so before we go down a path of several maps here and several other graphics and pieces of information, we have had um, a GIS analyst working on this for quite some time, and he's put together some information for you to see tonight. Understand the limitations of that. Um, it's based on the information that we have. We have not actually gone out and collected unique information to this, um, surveying lands, et cetera. So this is all based on existing information that we have in our system. This map shows the erosion hazard areas, the no disturbance areas, and the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies. So um, what it's done is if you flip back to this one, um, it actually shows the no disturbance area layered in there. So this, is, this shows erosion hazard and erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies. And then this adds the no disturbance area layer to that so you can see where we're actually talking about where the pilot program would actually have been um, eligible, but for those basins where it was not allowed per the previous slide. So there are some specific basins where the pilot program was not eligible because it was found to be inappropriate back in 2013 when the environmentally critical areas rules were being updated. This map shows um, the no disturbance area and the erosion hazard areas. Um, and this is important to note because our, our maps, although important for the purpose of identifying where we might find some of these areas, they're not perfect. All of these are driven by definition and they're, they're always required to be field verified, much like a wetland if you were delineating a wetland. We do actually ask that applicants um, obtain the services of a, a licensed um, surveyor, a licensed civil engineer with a specialty in geotechnical engineering, and a, a licensed geologist to help them in finding where these areas are actually located on the ground, because these maps were not all created at the same time, and the precision related to each of the different layers that you're looking at are not from the same generation of, of mapping. So to provide a basic overview of uh, some of the erosion hazard or, or geoscience areas that we've been talking about. Um, this is a breakdown of the number of parcels that are actually located in, in these areas. Um, so um, we've, we've broken it down in terms of the no disturbance area and erosion hazard or sensitive water bodies and erosion hazard areas and provided a percentage. And then because those areas don't always overlap perfectly, we've combined them all and then provided a total number of parcels that are located in the erosion hazard, erosion hazard near sensitive water body and no disturbance area. So of particular note, there are 1,171 parcels located in the no disturbance area in the city. There are 5,037 parcels located in all of the erosion hazard, erosion hazard near sensitive water body and no disturbance area. Um, some facts about the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay. Um, we took a look at the breakdown of the parcels, average parcel size, median parcel size, the King County assessors listed parcel value. Uh, we took a look at uh, the number of developed parcels versus the number of undeveloped parcels. 
um, with regard to undeveloped parcels, um, we, we took a look at uh, how many of them were located in the R1 zone, the R4 zone, the R6 zone. We took a look at uh, how many of them actually were overlaid by other uh, restrictions such as landslide hazards. Um, so in the instance of um, undeveloped parcels in the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies, there's 440 parcels. And of those parcels, 64% um, are, or 284 are located in landslide hazards as well, for example. Uh, we also took a look at the sizes of parcels and tried to break this down to get a better understanding of, of how many undeveloped parcels were in the erosion hazard near sensitive water body and what, what their characteristics were. Um, again, this is a map showing where the no disturbance areas are located. Um, these are some facts around the no disturbance areas. Um, again, looking at average parcel size, median size, um, and looking at how many are developed and how many are undeveloped. And if re you recall, um, there were, I think, what was it, 1,071 or 1,171, whatever the number was. So out of those, uh, 886 parcels are developed and 285 are undeveloped. Uh, we also took a look at um, the developed parcels in the no disturbance area specifically and then the, the undeveloped. So for the developed parcels, um, we also we did an overlap looking at where, where most of these were located in the R4 zone. We also took a look at, again, um, where other uh, critical areas or restrictions might apply. 90% of these are located in the erosion hazard area. Um, 95% um, are located in a critical drainage area, 79% in a landslide hazard area. So there are many uh, overlapping restrictions on these parcels, and these are the developed parcels. Um, the undeveloped parcels um, are shown here by breakdown, broken down by zoning. And the undeveloped parcels uh, 86% of them are also located in uh, landslide hazards. Uh, there are 285 total par undeveloped parcels in the no disturbance area. 95% um, are in the erosion hazard area. 95% uh, are in a critical drainage area. So again, uh, there are many overlapping restrictions that apply to these properties. Uh, we did take a look at um, some statistics around these. Um, and we, we wanted to get an understanding of uh, sort of what, what, the sub, what, what the potential for subdivision was in this area. Um, and uh, we noted that um, in the R1 zone, in order for you to subdivide, you would have to actually have two acres generally to, to create two lots uh, because the R1 zone is one dwelling unit per acre. So you'd have to break that down and have two acres in order to get two lots. And there were only 17 parcels that met that fundamental criteria. In the R4 zone, you'd have to have half an acre to get two lots. There were only 64 parcels that met that criteria. And in the R6, you'd have to have 14,520 square feet in order to get two lots. And there were only three parcels that met that criteria. So we're starting to narrow down where the uh, pilot program would have actually applied and understanding the number of parcels that it would have been, um, it, would, it, would have, it would have applied to. Um, so now getting into some analysis, um, we, in, in looking at the pilot program, we wanted to get an understanding of, of what actually would have been required if someone was to uh, develop a project um, and subdivide land within the no disturbance area. And in this case, um, some of the requirements for the two projects that are more likely to have been pursued, which would have been those projects that are pursuing a tight line, um, direct, direct line down to the lake for discharge, um, would have been a fairly costly endeavor given the, the the position in the landscape of many of these lots that, that would have been eligible would have required quite a long um, connection to get down to the lake. 
Um, we have talked to many applicants um, who were looking at using this program, and many of the smaller applic the applicants who had smaller pieces of property ha were finding it um, financially challenging to actually make that connection all the way down to the lake. So what was happening here was that um, because of the restrictions that were applied to these projects, potentially applied to projects through the pilot program, was that it was, it was pushing um, larger projects as being the ones that were more financially viable because the cost of actually ins designing and installing the required infrastructure could be absorbed by the larger project. A smaller project is much harder to actually build that much infrastructure associated with it and have it make sense. It's, it's common with sewer infrastructure as well. If you, you can't, if you can't actually absorb the cost in a larger land division, then you can't really afford to, to run the, the, the length of pipe and put in all the other elements required to service the subdivision. So it, it ends up making smaller projects not viable and it ends up promoting larger projects. Um, so what ends up happening is that um, this is counterintuitive to the intent, if you recall the intent and the definitions, and we, we walk through that. The, the pilot program is actually counterintuitive to the intent of the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies and the uh, properties that drain to the no disturbance area and the no disturbance area, uh, because larger projects are more prone to causing erosion impacts. We know um, through our experience in working with builders and inspecting construction sites that larger projects where there's a large area of earth that's being moved around are more prone to having larger failures and are harder to maintain erosion control methods, are harder to have a tighter control around construction activity, scheduling, timing, just because of the sheer size of the project. Um, smaller projects, you're, it's easier to actually have a a, a crew that's out there maintaining your, your erosion control measures and making sure that your, your earth moving is, is occurring at a faster pace during the right time of year, et cetera. So um, in this instance, our analysis is that because the cost of installing the required infrastructure drives a, lar drives a larger subdivision that would be what we would be seeing here, that it's not something that really is appropriate for this sensitive area. Um, so again, large scale subdivision within the, within the no disturbance area is not appropriate, uh, presents a high level of erosion risk and is contrary to the intent of the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay and the no disturbance area rules. Um, our recommendation is to permanently remove the pilot program uh, from the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies overlay. Uh, next steps are for uh, you to ask any questions you have of me tonight, um, have a discussion on this, uh, and then we'll be coming back um, on October 19th. And just a, a note, this slide was, was updated, and I don't know, this is a different version, but we had updated this slide, the November 6th, City Council meeting is not a public hearing. Um, that is a work session with the City Council, and my apology that somehow the, the graphic up here states that there's a public hearing there. This slide was meant to be updated, and I'm not sure how this one got in there, but it did, so my apology there. Thank you for a great presentation. Thanks. Okay, I'll open it up for questions this evening. Who wants to start? Jane, you can go ahead. I'm afraid of Robert's riddles of order. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let it stimulate the creativity. Well. In reading this, I was, I kept wondering, are you going to update it per the changes we made to 1310 and 1320 tonight. Will this uh, reflect tho those changes? So this, this will not influence or affect those changes. This is a separate set of rules. Um, the, 
uh, erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies restrictions um, were not influenced or impacted or changed in any way by the adjustments that were made to Title 13. Those are parallel regulations um, that are in a different set of rules. Okay. Then uh, I hate to get into such detail and start because I would rather be general, but uh, with this uh, 21A 52253A1A, what are appurtenances? I, I really want to know what that is. And maybe you could include it in the def in definitions or something. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the section in 21A uh, 5225 um, in the erosion hazard or sensitive water body that talks about uh, the no disturbance area and what development activities are permitted or permissible to occur. Um, and let me just check. So that was was that sub three, A. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and for single-family residences, associated landscaping, any appurtenances on pre-existing separate lots. So, appurtenance is something that is necessarily related to the use and enjoyment of that use. It's typical in shoreline permitting. It's a it's a common term that's used in in shorelines. Um, and and what that would be is like a deck. Um, maybe a patio, um, lawn, landscaping, um, most anything you would see that's, that's typical to use and enjoyment of a single family residential property. But those are permitted outright and not uh, uh, classified as impervious, right? They're, it's not restricted as pervious or impervious. So it could be impervious. Yes, that's correct. And that's that's a little bothersome to me. Then uh, in 3A1D, uh, it, it looks like the city could build all the parking lots they want in a in a in a uh, no disturbance area. Uh, and I and I I'm worried about that because parking lots are take up more impervious than buildings or. Roads, they, they can be massive, and they're with no limit on that. That, that is a concern to me. So, so as, as you pointed out um, earlier, there are parallel regulations that would also restrict that. So although it's allowed here, the ultimate size of a parking lot would be governed by um, stormwater regulations, which would restrict the amount of impervious um, because this area is also located in a critical, because as you saw from the statistics, most of the no disturbance areas are also overlaid or underlain by uh, the critical drainage areas, which you had been discussing previously tonight. So there are other restrictions that are not included here um, that are intended to limit the amount of impervious surface that can be located within a critical drainage area, if I'm correct. Okay, that's, I'm glad. It'll be caught somehow uh, through the, the different uh, regulations. The, the saying that I have is the finest filter catches the grain. Okay. Then uh, with, uh, is it okay to keep going or not? Um, um, maybe. Yeah. Let's see if there's any other questions and then we'll come back. How's that? Does anybody have any other questions or yeah. something they'd like to do? Rosie? Um, mine's more macro, David. Um, what is the difference between having a pilot program and not having one? How does that affect development and all that kind of thing? So we take this pilot program away, so say we do that, what are we left with? So, so even when the pilot program was um, enabled in March of 2017, it's important to point out that subdivision was still prohibited in the no disturbance area. The pilot program was only a very limited number of projects, a bundle of projects, a total of four, two, two subdivision projects with a tight line down to the lake and two subdivision projects with low impact development. Okay. So if we are to remove the pilot program, we are still maintaining that subdivision is prohibited 
but we're not offering sort of a, a bundle of projects that could proceed under a, a very unique or specific set of regulations. Define what was meant by pilot program, period. What, what is the definition? And, and when I think of pilot program, I think there's an end time. If you're building, though, I mean, something's permanent. A subdivision is going to be permanent. That's not a temporary thing in any way. So what was the definition when it first was put in order? The, the pilot program was put in place in order to explore whether subdivision could occur in the no disturbance area. And it, it, it came to be during the 2011 to 2013 timeframe when the environmentally critical areas rules were being updated and these, the, the discussion around the no disturbance area and the prohibition of development activity and subdivision within the no disturbance area was, was in front of the, 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 the then commission. Um, and was being processed for the purpose of making a recommendation to the city council. And there was um, public testimony on both sides of the issue. Some of the, the testimony was with regard to the inappropriateness of allowing development within this area. The other side of the testimony was from some of the property owners with regard to their interest in, in developing their, their property that they own. And the, the ultimately the, um, the, the solution that was presented was to develop a pilot program where they could, the property owners who wanted to develop could show that they were gonna do this the right way and they would be subject to certain parameters that would ensure that they would show it, but that, that really it was an opportunity for them to show that these areas could be developed in a, in a responsible and sensitive manner. Um, and that th that was what was recommended to the city council. And in order to ensure uh, a balance on the issue, it was, it was what ultimately ended up in the, in the environmentally critical areas rules. Thank you. And so are there other pilot programs in other areas of our code? Yes. Where are they? Uh, we have a wetland, an isolated wetland pilot program that only applies to the upland. It does not apply within the shoreline overlay, um, but that is for certain types of wetlands that um, the code essentially allows for a low grade wetland to be filled in instances for the purpose of development, um, but there's a limitation on the number of projects that can occur in that area. Uh, there may be others, I just can't recall offhand without taking a look. You could do a quick, I could do a quick code search later and find out for you if you'd like though. Um, in the essence of time, I'll just make my opinion, then I will ask a question, but I've been in a, quite a few meetings today where prevention was the key driving force uh, and people even use the term deep dive down into prevention, which uh, goes two things, first of all, I've had my extra strength flu shot and I feel good about it. Uh, now here's the, here's the question and I, maybe I don't need an answer now, but in prevention, flat land doesn't have a slope to it, but it probably, when you survey it, it, it does, is the termination, the terms that are used takes care of say a sinkhole uh, versus a l landslide, okay. So you, 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 you hit on an interesting point. Um, wh one of the things we've been looking at closely is, is the accuracy of the maps that you saw earlier this evening. Um, and we've noted that there is some, there are some flaws in those maps. We've looked at a few properties where the, we've been in discussion with the property owners around their interest to develop those lots. And the survey information that's coming back from the field is, is indicating that those, the, the mapped layer showing the erosion hazard area, the erosion hazard near sensitive water body and the no disturbance area is not actually where it is on the map. That's just like a wetland though. We do have maps that show wetlands to be in certain locations and 
the maps are intended to be a best a best effort of identifying where these these sensitive features in the landscape might exist and we then it then causes us when when development is proposed to take a closer look at those properties and we work with applicants and their their surveyors then their engineers and their geologists to get a handle on on what actually is on the property so one of the things we will be doing um, regardless of the outcome of this effort is we will be working to create criteria around how to better field map these these sensitive features um, so that property owners who have these now if you recall you can subdivide property in the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies if it's not in the no disturbance area so just because it's in the no disturb just because you might have a corner of the property in a no disturbance area doesn't mean you can't subdivide the rest of your property and it doesn't mean that it detracts from density so you should think of a, a, a no disturbance area much like a wetland in that you have to delineate it you can't subdivide in it you can't build in it more or less um, and that it should be set aside in a tract or some other um, per, you know conservation feature on the property but the one thing that's different between a wetland and a, and a no disturbance area is that a no disturbance area does not come out of density meaning that if you have a no disturbance area on your property you, it doesn't harm you in terms of the number of units you could ultimately build whereas a wetland does understanding our code and, and if you recall from the meeting on the 21st we talked about critical areas well some critical areas when you're looking at subdividing a piece of property come out of the total density you're allowed to build so in the case of a wetland the wetland and the wetland buffer area are deducted from the gross lot area to give you a net usable area and that net usable area is what you're ultimately calculating the number of units you can build on now it's important to remember that in the case of the no disturbance area it does not come out of density so you could see a project you could see a parcel where the you know corner of the lot is in the no disturbance area and the rest of the property is not they could subdivide that property subject of course to critical drainage area rules and landslide hazard area restrictions and all the other things that go along with it um, but the no disturbance area may not be the driving factor as to whether or not they can subdivide the balance of the land outside of the no disturbance area uh, Eric do you have any so currently there's there have been no projects approved under the pilot program right so, yeah, it was we do not we did not receive um, a complete application in the time frame under which the uh, pilot program was uh, active and no the answer is no we do not have any have we have we learned new information since the pilot program was first introduced as a way of kind of has there been new information that's come to light As far as the you know applicability or applicability or the you know the suitability for this pilot program, you know each year we learn new information, and it sounds like this pilot program was introduced quite a while ago, and it took a long time to come online due to some other triggers, and really the window just just is, was very narrow, and I was just wondering if there was more information that has come to light that maybe changed our minds about this altogether and whether it was a good idea in the first place. I understand that the, the, the intent for it at the beginning, but, but maybe that has been outweighed by new information. So I'm, I'm not sure there were any real scenarios that had been run when the original ECA conversations were ongoing regarding including the, the pilot program in the no disturbance area rules during the 2013 uh, review and one of the things that is different is that we actually have talked to a couple property owners about um, actual development proposals and have seen some walk away with smaller parcels and smaller projects that they were wanting to utilize the the pilot program for um, because of the sheer cost 
and we have seen projects come forward that actually had wanted to move through um, that uh, were larger projects that were viable because they could absorb the cost. We have not heard anybody have any interest in utilizing the two projects that were the low impact development projects because those are, if you look at the restrictions opposed to those, only 10% of the total property area can be included as impervious surface, which is a very, very low amount um, for a subdivision when you have to incorporate. One, one of the things that we face with, with development is that you have rules that tend to collide with each other. You have standards for roads and sidewalks and driveways and parking areas and all of those things. And then you have restrictions on the limitation on the amount of impervious surface that you can provide and the expense in, in trying to collect and detain and treat and convey the stormwater that goes along with those impervious surfaces that you're required to build. So what, what happens is, is that in order for a project to actually make sense, all the factors, they have to be able to meet all of the, the infrastructure requirements. Um, and there usually is a, a tipping point where a project is viable and profitable for a, a builder or developer to actually pursue. And what we're talking about here are the, is the fact that those smaller projects that you, we feel are more appropriate for a pilot program where we're, we're looking at allowing, you know, a few limited projects under restrictions to proceed in the no disturbance area um, based on the intent of the no disturbance area is we're ending up with large projects. And it's just contrary to the intent. Um, and I don't feel like the original discussions that occurred around the pilot program really got into sufficient detail as to whether it was viable and what in what the market would be driving, especially that the markets changed today from what it was back in 2011, leading to 2013. Um, you know, we're, we're land economics are very different at this moment in time, and, and they could change again. My next question has to do with, you were talking about the mapping and things like that. So the, uh, the, the mapping, is that based on largely topography or is there other subsurface geology that's involved and how difficult is that mapping exercise gonna be? Yeah, so what, what we would do is we would, you know, someone would come into the desk and they would say, hey, I wanna subdivide this piece of property and we'd pull up our maps, which, you know, we now have online that you can see as well. Um, and we would look at the parcel and we'd say, hey, you know, you're in an erosion hazard in a sensitive water body and you have a no disturbance area on your property. Um, you need to, before you proceed with doing anything else, hire a qualified consultant to tell you where the extent and boundary of that no disturbance area is. And you would then, that would inform you as to how you would proceed. And you would also look at other overlapping restrictions like the critical drainage areas and the landslide hazard areas. Um, all these these geohazard areas that would apply. Um, and what would happen is the applicant would first probably go out with, our customer would first probably go out and hire a, uh, a um, licensed surveyor who would go out to the property and pick up points all over the property, um, elevation points, and they would then run a model in, in AutoCAD that would tell them how steep the property is and it would create a, a profile of the property. And then they would know, well, where are these areas that are steeper than 15% um, um, in order to identify those at first. And then they would bring on board a, a licensed uh, civil engineer and a licensed geologist and they would go out to the property and dig some holes and take a look at the soils and get an understanding of, of what actual soil conditions are, are on, the, on the ground because the maps you're looking at are based on, on on interpolation of points that were collected many years ago by by various authorities. You know the U.S. Geological Survey, the the um, King County Conservation um, District soil soil surveys. There's all these different um, entities that have collected information over time. But really, the best way to know what soils are on the property is to go visit the property. Um, and then what would happen is they would submit a report to us and we would take a look at it and review it, verify the credentials of the people that, that prepared it. And we have an on-call consultant as part of our on-call consultant, if you're aware, we, we use it regularly for things like streams and wetlands. 
we do also have a geotechnical component to those contracts. And um, what we would do is we would send the report off to our third party independent consultant who would essentially audit the report, um, go do a site visit, take a look at the, the information presented, and then they would give us a, a um, professional response as to whether they feel that that they agree with the uh, applicant's consultant. So what we're trying to do there is make it transparent and make sure that that the applicant is providing the information and you know and that their their consultants are doing are sticking to the science and not being persuaded by other means. Um, Matthew, do you have anything? I guess what or, oh wait. Uh, Commissioner uh, Garrison, I'm sorry. I was going to ask if Commissioner Petras had, no. had anything oh, to say. Thank you. No, uh, actually, other people have asked the questions I had. I'm okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when we get this packet, one little question. When we get this packet, I go through and I read it in detail, and I try to answer your questions. And when I do, I feel like I'm missing the point. I feel like I'm being too picky too early and not general enough. I wish we could be specific so we knew what we were looking for. When, when I spent a lot of time going through and working on word choice, working on uh, thoughts, working on uh, solutions for some of these things, and I don't think we're ready for that. So I would like to know what we're supposed to be doing, what you expect of us, so that I don't waste my time. I think this evening we're supposed to hear from Mr. Pyle. We're supposed to discuss, and if you want to give your opinion on whether or not you're in favor of the pilot program, you, we can do that tonight. But we will have the public hearing at the next meeting, and that will be the time that we will decide to either keep the pilot program or eliminate the pilot program. I think that is the, that is what city council has asked of us. That wasn't clear to me. It was, we've got these reports with a lot of detail in them, and I thought so they were asking for our opinion on these, on these uh, Do you mean the work they supplied? Are you, are you meaning that you wanted to make changes to the memo that Mr. Pyle prepared or that you wanted to, to make code, changes to the pilot the program? Code, uh, the way it reads, and I assumed that they wanted our input on the way it reads. So I went through, worked on the details, and I think I wasted my time. Um, are you talking about, did you make changes to the code or did you make changes to the pilot program? To the code. But which part, I guess I'm, I'm asking, because um, when Mr. Pyle gave us... Well, appurtenances was not, uh, so that was something I picked up. It, that, that didn't have a definition. I went through and picked at the code because I thought that's what they wanted. But I don't think it is what they want. So I think I wasted my time. I think I think maybe you may have gotten a little bit too detailed. You're right. Um, my my interpretation is that we need to look at the code and look at the pilot program and determine whether or not we want subdivisions in the no disturbance area because that's really the question before us. The question is if we keep the pilot program, then we are saying that we would allow up to four subdivisions in the no disturbance area. Um, which I'll just state right now, I, I'm not in support of that. I am in support of eliminating the pilot program. So that is really the question before us. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want to eliminate the pilot program, then you will eliminate the, or then you are in favor of eliminating the ability to subdivide in the no disturbance area. So that is what I see as our task is to decide which you're in favor of. And during the public hearing, we will, we can deliberate, we can make small changes if necessary, but really to me, I, I see it as black and white, you know, as David recommended, it's, there should be no subdivisions in the nose disturbance area. So that's how I and see I, it. I kind of second that. I think that's what's the, I can't speak for the council, but we, that's what the council is asking us to do is to give them a 
indication of how the planning commission feels about uh, not continuing the pilot project. So if uh, and when the um, code would be revised in the future, is there a possibility that pilot programs could be presented again in the same manner that it was brought up originally? Anything, it could be proposed through public testimony or um, you know, in, in, a, in a workshop setting um, when we're updating the critical areas rules. Uh, I think it's fairly unlikely that it would be included in the future. Uh, just, just I, you know, I, I, I can't read the future, so I don't know. But it, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of other restrictions that apply to these properties as well. So, it, it, seeing that we allow for a subdivision to occur in a no disturbance area, well, there's three other overlapping restrictions that apply. So you may not even be able to subdivide, and that's been one of the challenges here is that. The, it, they may not have considered when they were originally talking about the pilot program, all these other restrictions and regulations and costs that go along with development, which land, which put us basically in the situation we're in now where all we're seeing are these large, you know, 30 plus lot proposals that are requiring a lot of clearing and grading and, and impact. You know, they're, they're large open ground projects Right, I, I didn't mean to trip you up there with soothsaying into the future, you know. But um, the, the fact is this happened. I'm not in favor of pilot programs. I, I think you, decide, you, you said earlier that codes do conflict sometimes. They bump into each other. Why add this other element? The fact that it's possible in the future, yes, but it sounds like the staff would be um, less likely to look into this and pursue it, let alone the council um, wanting to go for it. But I, that's my hope because it's complicated enough out there. The, the proper relief valve for mechanism in the code for dealing with the unique situation is a variance. Mm -hmm. it, it is not a pilot program. Um, and we have them in our code and we're, we deal with them as we do. Uh, but there are other relief valves in the code for properties that are facing restriction where there are unique circumstances and there is a hardship being faced by the property owner. Okay, if there's any more questions, we can entertain that. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next item of business. How, how are we doing this? People feel good? All right, so the next item of business is public comment this evening. Um, we did hear from some people who spoke during the public hearing and I think probably intended to speak during this section. Um, and don't worry about that, you don't need to speak again. We did hear you, we appreciate your comments. But if you would like to speak again, you're certainly allowed and you would have five minutes. So, Is there anyone who'd like to speak on this item? Ms. Wichter. Um, this would be an agenda item, so this is the only item you'd be able to speak on. Mary Wichter at 408 208th Avenue, Northeast Cincinnati. So I'm only talking about erosion related things. I am glad that this city is looking at pulling the pilot project. I think it is concerning when you're having a lot of houses 20, 30 or more. Um, I just will remind you that the Inglewood and Tamarack areas have a lot of vacant lots. And when you're not looking at the sub basins that they're in, you're getting that. And like Inglewood has stuff in the no disturbance area. Um, so I think even pulling the private, I think you have to look further than that because I think you're going to end up with things where you have multiple lots and they're going to disturb areas and they are going to cause problems. Um, and uh, it, it, it just is, it's related to the amount of, the, the amount of work that you have to do. You can't just look at a single lot, a single lot, a single lot, a single lot. Like this is the first time you've seen my overlays of the multiple maps and you've seen his overlay of the multiple maps. And I would also ask, um, you guys are using different colors than King County did. And then like your maps had different colors than mine did tonight, which they're both tools. <laughs> It'd be nice if you'd settle on colors that would actually work and be consistent so it's not confusing like is landslide orange or is 
no disturbance area orange, that type of thing should really be consistent. But I'm glad to see the pilot program getting pulled. Um, I do think piping things is a lot safer. I feel like Tamarack is a pilot program that was never announced that was put in and it uses lid and low impact development. And I think we've seen the result of that. So I'm glad that that definitely is something that people weren't doing because I just think it's not right to do that. And the only other thing I'll say is if you're doing the landslide hazard areas into the erosion and you're allowing water to go in, you're putting in water that can pop out later there. And so I still don't think, like even though the code's different, I still think you have to think about the connections of those, which is what all my slides were about. So thanks. Thank you. Looks like we have one more speaker. Just please state your name and uh, place of residence. Hello, uh, name is Dennis Malone. Uh, I live on Southeast 21st Street in Sammamish. And uh, I guess uh, since I did the PowerPoint, I'm just gonna show it to you anyway. Um, we, we absolutely applaud uh, the direction that, that staff is recommending as far as the pilot program. If nothing else, uh, I think I'll show you one example of someone that might have applied for the pilot program that, that we just feel would be a terrible mistake if it was allowed to proceed. Uh, the Parker Platt is uh, 15 acres. It's actually two pieces, two parcels, uh, a five acre parcel on the left third and then a 10 acre parcel on the right two thirds. Uh, on, on this land uh, is a 1916 dwelling, the Rainy Home, which is uh, the Sammamish Heritage Society has interest in that. Uh, can I, I, can, I can change the slides or you, okay, there we go. This is what they want to do with that property. Um, as you can see, the five acre plot on the left hand side uh, would really just be for, for a road to come into uh, the property, not uh, a lot, maybe five or six uh, houses on that section, but the majority of the development is happening uh, on the 10 acre uh, piece of that land. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, here's that, that property with the erosion risk overlay on it. And as you can see, the 10 acre lot is completely in the erosion risk area and that's where all the development's gonna happen. And the next slide uh, shows the landslide hazard. And again, the 10 acre parcel is completely uh, in the landslide hazard area. The next slide is the one that blows my mind. Here's the zoning, the, the 10 acre parcel is zoned R6. I mean, it's the most sensitive part of, of this person's land and it's zoned for uh, six houses per acre, whereas the other piece is only zoned for, uh, for R4, which is you know, similar to the, the property around it, but still in, in such a, a sensitive area, really just doesn't make sense at all. I think I got one. Uh, anyway, lots of words. I'm not gonna go into all this. I think you get the idea, but uh, one that we just would hate to see sneak through under a pilot program like this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, encouraged to hear that there are lots of other regulations and restrictions that they might have bumped into even if they did get through the pilot program. Uh, they might not have been able to go forward with it, but um, this is one, uh, an example of why there shouldn't even be pilot programs because you might end up ripping up and, and uh, building a subdivision of 30 homes right on the side of the plateau, which just doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Oh, let me just see. Are, is there anyone else who'd like to speak this evening? Okay. Um, make a motion to take some action items. Oh, I don't think I have to. I'm, I'm, I'll close public comment. Looking at the uh, Directory of Community Development, uh, would we be able to extend tonight's meeting to end uh, no later than 8.45? Does, does, does that give you enough time, sir? Well, I can be much quicker than that, so. Um, but sure, That's your answer. sounds great if, if the commission is, is so inclined. So. <laughs> If there's no objective to objection to extending the meeting to 8:45, um, or if there is any objective objection, say so. Okay, we will extend the meeting to 
Okay, I think that's my cue then. I'm sorry, the next item of business is director report. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, good evening, Planning Commission, and all those in attendance this evening. Uh, Jeff Thomas with the Planning Department. And I have two short uh, items for you this evening. Uh, the first one is informational in nature. The uh, City Council on Tuesday evening, you may already be aware, um, adopted a moratorium on development uh, citywide for six months. The chair clearly does not know. Um, so um, this came up, um, it was not a scheduled agenda item on the council's calendar. Uh, council raised this matter um, when they got to the part in their agenda related to the uh, transportation element and amendments to that related to traffic and concurrency um, and so forth. So an ordinance passed um, Tuesday evening that um, is a six month emergency ordinance on development. There will be a public hearing on the matter. Um, a public hearing is still being, uh, the date is still being finalized by our clerk, our city clerk's office. So uh, stay tuned for that. I will definitely keep you apprised of happenings here over the next um, couple months with what's happening with it. Um, and uh, the council's goal is to really continue and finish the work that they've started related to uh, the transportation element of the comp plan, the concurrency, the traffic model, and really resetting some of that um, to, um, to the level and the level of detail that they feel they need to be able to move forward and lift the moratorium to allow development to proceed down the road. So. Um, we're not sure how much time that's going to take. The council um, has, has uh, been very clear that they're serious about working on it and um, moving through this body of work that they've started here in the last um, five weeks or so. So that was the first item. Um, I'll complete that by saying if you receive any inquiries, telephone calls, or emails from uh, citizens or other constituents, stakeholders, um, if feel free to contact Kelly, refer them over to staff. We'd be help, happy to work with you on a response or if you would like us to respond on your behalf, of course, we'd be happy to do that as well. Um, I know I've spent the better part of two days fielding a lot of telephone calls and emails and meeting requests and so forth uh, for folks that are uh, both for and uh, not for the moratorium. So we'll continue to do that at the staff level and of course, keep you apprised and work with city council. Uh, Mr. Thomas, are there any exemptions, or is it complete there is moratorium? A, there is actually a lengthy list of exemptions. Um, we'll, we'll actually send a signed copy of the ordinance around to the Planning Commission, so you can have that and take a look at it. Um, with all the questions that we've received, a lot of what ifs, of course, um, we have compiled a, a list of subsequent questions over the last couple of days that we've sent to our city attorney's office and we're going to be discussing those next week. So there may be, uh, we certainly expect there will be clarifications um, to come here in short order. So, um, Mr. Thomas, I want to commend the city. Uh, there is a, on their website under current news, uh, what is that, October 4th, they did have a synopsis of of what the moratorium moratorium would look like and so i just think that's great that it got out there that soon yeah we, we have that and we also have some uh, kind of an faq sheet uh, I'm not sure if that's what the vice chair was specifically referring to but if you go on our website there's an faq sheet and there's some other information on there as well so Thank you for that. Great. So that was the first item. The second item is actually a request. Um, speaking of city council, uh, council member uh, Malcho has um, brought forward to council under her committee report a few weeks ago um, a desire to go back and have some, some discussion and some brainstorming about um, our subdivision process and specifically the front end of the process that involves neighborhood meetings and public outreach. Uh, before an actual application is submitted. And um, so council, um, through a little bit of discussion that occurred when this was brought up, uh, gave the green light for um, an ad hoc committee to be formed to, to simply do just that, have some discussion and some brainstorming about how the process is working, uh, whether we need to look at some potential changes and what those might be. 
So um, Council Member Malcho volunteered to be on that. Um, I'm going to uh, be part of that from staff, possibly with one other staff member. And uh, Council expressed a, a specific request if a planning commissioner would be interested in also joining that group and uh, being part of that. And then we might look to the outside for um, a couple of stakeholders from the outside as well to join us. So uh, my request um, to the chair is if you could solicit any interest from uh, your planning commission colleagues, if someone would be interested in helping us out with that, we'd be very grateful. Um, I can do that now. Is anyone interested? Can the chair request that we get information uh, about what the, the time frame is, the um, I would be interested in that. Yeah, general well. commitment that would be expected. Yeah, I would be really interested in that. So I'd be happy to answer that yeah, question. Okay. Um, the time commitment, we expect um, the, the general outlay that put forward was that we would meet two or three times uh, between now and the end of the year. So perhaps about once a month average, mm -hmm. probably for an hour to an hour and a quarter. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, again, just dialogue, brainstorming, and see where it goes mm -hmm. after a couple of sessions. I'd love to. I okay. think that would be fun. I think you have a volunteer, Commissioner O'Farrell. And are there any, is there any other interest? I would certainly be interested if there's room. Um, but uh, okay. if they're only looking for one, then I'm I'm. You're good. Happy for Roisin to. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> I think we're always right. happy, the more the merrier, obviously not more than three, but um, uh, usually stuff like this is hard to get volunteers, so I was hoping for one, so uh, two would be great if, uh, if that's what we'd like to do. I'd be happy to follow up with mm -hmm. both of you uh, offline, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss dates for potential meetings and availability and so forth. We have no set schedule at this moment, so. Great. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you both for volunteering, and if you decide, Matthew, that it's not for you, don't don't feel bad. Come on, did you find? We'll, we'll see. We we'll see how he acts when he gets the directive to bring coffee and cookies. To <laughs> see if he still comes. So. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Thomas. Report, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> okay, so the next item of business is the chair's report. So uh, hang in there with me. I'm going to try to make this quick. But uh, we do have some administrative things that I want to bring forward tonight. Um, so you're all aware that the Planning Commission has recently extended our meetings past 9 o'clock on several occasions. So I am trying to make a way for us to be more efficient. And in order to do that, I have two time-saving measures that I think would help that I want to uh, that I want us to, to consider tonight. Um, the first measure is actually to authorize staff to record action-only minutes, and this is something that Commissioner Anderson was asking for for quite a while. Um, action-only minutes will state that only the actions that were taken by the commission, not what was said during the meeting, will be recorded in the minutes. And um, this will not only save time for staff who currently have to sift through video, you know, watching the video three or four or five times before they finish our minutes. Um, it's also helpful for the other people that are reviewing them and looking at them. I think if, if we need to, or if you want to see details, of course the videos are all online on YouTube and on our city's website, so I don't think it's really necessary to have that all written out. Um, and this, it's very important to know that the city council currently uses action only minutes. So to me, it, you know, it only makes sense that uh, the city council follows suit, or I mean the planning commission follows suit. So um, I'm gonna make a motion because we do need to vote on it because we need to change our bylaws. So I move to authorize city staff to record action minutes of the meetings of the planning commission in accordance with article five minutes and records of the planning commission bylaws to streamline the implementation of Sammamish Municipal Code 2.60.0304 and that is in parentheses documentation. Um, Second. Okay, so there is a motion and a second. Is there any debate? Will we still have the charts available at times when there's questions that, you know, there's usually a, um, even in city council, a grid that will say commission asks this, staff recommends this. Yeah, I guess like like Tony had put together for us that she calls it the matrix. Exactly. Where so if there's substantial questions, that. yeah, no, no, that's very this important. is more just 
you know, Chair Collins said that she agreed with this, and so and so that's said she agreed with this. I just wanted to clarify, though, I, I that we still have that tool available, which yeah, is really I think important. that's really important. You're right. Okay. Yeah, because that sort of shows that shows our discussion and our concerns rather than saying how we feel about things. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So there is a motion and a second. And so we'll go ahead and vote. And then I move, the motion is to authorize city staff to record action minutes of the meeting. And I'm not gonna go through the whole motion again. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. Okay, so that passes unanimously. So that should help. Merry Christmas, Kevin. <laughs> Stop writing. <laughs> okay, so the second measure is to reduce the amount of public comment time um, from seven minutes for non-agenda items to three minutes for non-agenda items. It would be three minutes for individuals and five minutes for organizations. And I, I don't want anyone to have um, bad feelings about this. It's not that we don't wanna hear from the public. City Council only hears three minutes um, for agenda items and non-agenda items. So I, I just feel that the Planning Commission should be in the same in the same boat with the city council. And since we just can't seem to get our meetings finished by 8.30, I think those additional minutes will, or those fewer minutes will actually help get us there. So I move to revise article six, public involvement of the planning commission bylaws to allow three minutes per person for public comment on agenda and non-agenda topics, or five minutes per person if representing the official position of a recognized community organization. Um, I second. Is there any debate? Yeah, how often, I'm trying to think back how often that was an issue. I mean, how many times we had public comment where the public comment portion of our meeting is what is really causing the time overrun. I think that it seems like our meetings here are a little, little lower key than city council and maybe they're the public feels a little more comfortable talking to us maybe, so I don't, I feel worried about limiting the amount of time, but at the same time, I, I understand the need for kind of streamlining and kind of making things the same, but I wanna be cautious about. No, I hear you. I, yeah, I think people do feel more comfortable because it's not as formal, so that, that definitely opens the line of communication more, so it's a good point. I kind of agree with Eric. I don't think the public's causing the problem. I think we are, and I think if staff would be really clear about the action they want, what they want us to do, I know I would take a lot less time. I think I generate a lot of mess, and I and I and confusion because I'm trying to follow what they say here. And it says, to, it lays it out. I don't know how everybody else knows that we, they just wanna talk about the pilot program and not the code. That's not what I'm reading. I'm reading that they wanna know about the code and the pilot program both. So I start with the code. And I think that's confusing. So I want staff to be more direct with us and tell us what they want. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I generally agree. I'd much rather limit, um, no, I'm sorry, not, uh, find the savings not in limiting the public comment, but rather in um, our new and improved uh, Robert's Rules procedures and in working with the staff on creating materials that um, are efficient and are clear so that we know exactly what the 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 uh, the what they're trying to get us to do, and I, and I, I think a lot of that is simply uh, formatting, you know, so we know what we're looking at. I agree. I know um, we well certainly I when I applied for the commission um, was hoping for more public comment over time, and it seems like it there has been, and I really appreciate everybody's comments and continued attendance at our meetings. That has not always been the case, I think, with planning commission meetings, correct, yeah. in the past? So um, I is there anything that, I don't mind going over 8.30, and, and yeah. sometimes we have to because two significant items end up being on the agenda. Sometimes it's just a matter of these weighty 
topics need to have the deliberation, need to have the feedback from the public. Um, I don't mind if we shorten the public I, uh, uh, from seven to three. I think people stay well within that anyway, even three minutes. But um, even if we were to leave it there, I'd encourage more people to come and speak at our meetings and give feedback, write to us. Um, that could save time too. People can certainly, who don't feel comfortable speaking on camera, um, knowing that this is recorded. Yeah, write to us, give us your feedback. We need that, that's what we are here to do. So the fact that we run over 8.30, is there something in our, uh, our charter that says we have to end at 8.30? No, I'm just trying to be. Okay. I'm just trying to. I mean, I understand. You know. <laughs> we don't want to go to midnight like council <laughs> has. That's ridiculous. And we need to be efficient. Yeah, I'm just trying to be thoughtful of people's time. I and we're respectful of each other to that end. Yeah. It seems like there there is consideration within commissioners. Uh, and I also think, you know, our work plan is the way it is because there are a lot of items that we need to get through. And so. Well, we won't be able to limit the amount of items, right? We, we have to keep on our work plan. So we'll just have to do, if, if, you, if we decide to you know, leave public comment at seven minutes, which you guys are persuading me that it's important, um, you know, then we'll just be more efficient on the back end or we'll extend our meeting. That's, that's not a problem for me either. Yeah, it, I think we should go with the motion and support it. Uh, it's not so much here, and again, I'm looking at the time. We're the ones that are going over right now, but every couple minutes we save, um, I think it's, it's just good. And the other thing is we're not discouraging public comment. We're encouraging more f of the public to either write in or speak. And this, again, would be in the same format as the city council. I just feel comfortable there. So I call for the question. Okay, so there is a motion and a second. So all those in favor of revising Article 6, public involvement of the Planning Commission bylaws to allow three minutes per person for public comment on agenda and non-agenda topics, or five minutes per person if representing the official position of a recognized community organization, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed say no. no? No. No. Okay, so we will keep our minutes, or we will keep public comment at seven minutes per person. And the motion was declined, I guess you say. Six to one. All right, so with that, sorry for that waste of time. Um, <laughs> the next item of business is adjournment and the meeting is now adjourned. It is 8.47 it looks like.